Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians uh, chapter 12, that is uh, page 1137, at least the portion we'll be reading is page 1137 in the Pew Bible. Uh, you'll also want to find your way to page 222 in the Forms and Prayers book as uh, we will be confessing question and answer 55 together following the reading of the word. But first, give attention to God's word, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, beginning with verse 12. This is the word of God. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Thus far, God's word. Now, uh, giving attention to question 55, uh, page 222 of our Forms and Prayers, I'll ask the question and ask that you respond in unison. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that believers, one and all, as members of Christ the Lord, have communion with him and share in all his treasures and gifts. Second, that each member should consider it a duty to use these gifts readily and joyfully for the service and enrichment of the other members. Dear brothers and sisters, friends, uh, tonight, we come to consider briefly one of the often uh, overlooked elements of the Christian faith and uh, an element of the faith that is uh, very much overlooked in the 21st century. Uh, we've noticed uh, or noted before the tendency toward individualism in the West. And uh, I believe that uh, anyone who uh, has uh, any degree of, of discernment can see that this uh, trend is something that has really deeply and uh, negatively impacted the church of Jesus Christ. And it is a problem that to some degree affects us as a body as well, as it does 
every body of Christ in the West. I believe the communion of saints. A simple line, six words in English, something that we confess uh, so frequently that we have it memorized. We can rattle it off. But what does it mean? What, what is the significance of what we are confessing when we say, I believe the communion of saints? That's our consideration. That's our theme this evening the communion of saints. Now, one of the great wonders of the gospel is this, that God, for so many of those whom he calls out of darkness into light, so many of those whom he calls unto salvation in his Son, incorporates that, uh, those people, those individuals, into his family. We talk often about the family of God. And this is an idea that we get from the scriptures, uh, thinking, for example, um, of Ephesians chapter 3, uh, where we read of the Father uh, after whom the whole family on heaven and on earth is named. Uh, interestingly, two weeks ago, I think it was, when uh, we considered the doctrine of the church uh, from uh, in keeping with uh, question and answer 54, we talked about the idea of the universal church and how that is um, more expansive than just uh, simply all the way around the world, but that it refers to um, all the way from the beginning of time to the end of time. Well, the same is true of our family history. Now, some of you are perhaps interested in genealogy and, and uh uh, you, you might pull out books and you might uh, show photos, uh, different uh, records of your family. You might be able to tell me when your family first immigrated uh, here from whatever country that might have been. It's important to you. But the Bible introduces us to a family history that goes all the way back to the very beginning, beginning of time, to the Garden of Eden, to one man, and one woman. And it is this uh, one human race, uh, those uh, saved from the human race, who become the family of God. So uh, as we consider the communion of saints, we, we're going to actually be looking at two elements. Um, and, and what we've been talking about for the moment is the really the second element that we'll be discussing this evening. But the catechism helpfully describes for us the fact that the believer has communion with Christ. And then flowing out of that communion that we enjoy with Christ, uh, there is a communion that we have with the body of Christ. So uh, the two ideas we want to consider this evening are the believer's communion with Christ and believer's communion with one another. So consider, first of all, the believer's communion with Christ. Um, as we've read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, every believer is incorporated into what is called Christ's body. Uh, every believer is made a part of Christ's body. Look at verse 12. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. He's describing, at this point, the human body. So I look at you and I don't see a hand, I don't see a nose, uh, but rather I see a composite of all of these elements as a unit. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Uh, you see what he's saying, right? Uh, the significance of the fact that um, regardless of our ethnic history, regardless of our demographic status, uh, we, could con uh, we could bring Galatians uh, into this discussion as well and say uh, regardless of our sex, we are incorporated uh, through faith in Christ by uh, the power and the work of the Holy Spirit into the one body of Christ. 
And the beautiful thing about this is that Christ uh, dispenses, uh, and the old-fashioned word would be communicates, uh, but we use that word rather differently, but he dispenses his graces and his gifts to his people through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that is uh, a part of Paul's overarching point in 1 Corinthians 12, right? Uh, that as we partake of the Spirit, uh, Christ's liberality, his generosity, comes to expression in his body, the church, through the gifts and the graces of Jesus that are manifest in us. Think about that. That is quite wonderful, isn't it? That if you are in Jesus Christ tonight, you have his spirit in you, thus you are united to him, his, uh, can, I, can I use this phrase, his spiritual blood flows through your veins, pumping gifts and graces out to us, his members. What a wonderful reality it is to be a Christian, to partake of the grace of Christ in this way. And that, this is what the catechism means by communion. Uh, that we have communion with Christ and share in all his treasures and gifts. Uh, Paul says something uh, similar in uh, Romans 8, verse 17, that adds a, a different nuance. He says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, the, the, the incredible part of this is, is what Romans 8, 17 is communicating is not that Jesus divides his inheritance with us. Some for you, some for you, some for you, some for you. No, what Paul is communicating is all that belongs to Jesus is yours and yours and yours and yours. No division. The inheritance is not divided, but it is shared. Paul says the same thing in a different way in Colossians 2, verse 10, where he says, you have been given fullness in Christ. Uh, just before this, he says, uh, says what about Christ? The fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. And then he says, you have the fullness of Christ in you. So the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ bodily and the fullness of Christ now dwells in you. You have fullness in him. You see, we don't receive a measure or a portion of Christ. Rather, to believe in Jesus is to receive the whole Christ. Um, this, uh, Paul prays this in Ephesians 3 verses 16 and following, where he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that, note these words, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The whole Christ, right? He goes on to say, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, and note these words, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. The believer is the richest person in the universe. Have you ever thought about that? Because to receive Christ, to be incorporated into his body, to commune with him is to receive the immeasurable riches of Christ. One commentator uh, gives a few examples of the riches of Christ. We're going to run through them quickly. Uh, he says, everything, quote, everything that is Christ's own belongs also to those who believe on him. His father, uh, John chapter 20, verse 17. His love, John 17, verses 23 through 26. His name, Revelation 3, verse 12. His merits, Romans 4, verse 24. His inheritance, Romans 8, verse 17. His glory, John 17, verse 
24. More could be said. But that's sufficient to illustrate the point. You see, to have everything without Christ is to experience the deepest kind of poverty that a person can know. It is to be eternally impoverished. You could be the richest man in the world, the richest woman in the world. You could possess seemingly unlimited power and clout. And yet, without Christ, it is nothing. But to have Christ, even without anything else beside, is to be wealthy beyond imagination. Boys and girls, sometimes uh, maybe you think about, it'd be nice to have more money. Now, I could give you a lesson about how wealthy we are, but we're not going to go there tonight. But know this. If you truly desire to be rich, boys and girls, riches come through faith in Jesus Christ. Because in Christ, you get the fullness of God. So the believer's communion uh, is with Christ. Every believer experiences communion with Christ. But then this leads to uh, a duty, uh, which is that uh, believers are to have communion with one another. Or actually, I, I shouldn't emphasize duty first and foremost, simply the reality. Uh, that just uh, uh, as uh, my left ear did not actually choose um, to have fellowship with my right ear, uh, and these fingers did not choose to have fellowship with these toes, um, that decision was made for them sovereignly by God uh, by virtue of being put on the same body, motivated by the same brain with the same heart. So also, um, every one of us, by virtue of believing in uh, the one Savior, Jesus Christ, being indwelt by His uh, one Spirit, uh, uh, confessing the one faith, have been brought into communion. We have been incorporated as members into the same body. And so we need to get used to each other. Uh, it, it would be better for us to get used to each other sooner rather than later. And it would be, get, be better um, if we could learn to appreciate what each one brings to the body. What is the right ear without the left ear? What is the left eye without the right eye? Some of you actually know the answer to that question by hard experience. Isn't it true? Well, so Christ has put his body together. Look at what he says, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. He says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So there is that individuality, right? Uh, there is the individual recognition, your individual relationship to Christ, and, and that matters. But now if you, if you move up, um, he says, verse 13, he uses another term, but in, uh, another universal term, but not, instead of each, it is all. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Now, his teaching, in, uh, th th there is a lot that we could say if we were to really dig deep into uh, verses 14 through 26. And we don't have the time to, to dig as deeply as we would like to. Uh, but there are a few things that we ought to take away for our benefit and understanding this evening. Note, first of all, that just as every part of the human body uh, body has some particular function. Yes, even those uh, organs which we were once told uh, were extra, tonsils, appendix, spleen. Just as every part of the human body has some particular function, so also every member of the body of Christ has a particular function. Some may have a more seemingly significant function. That is true. Paul recognizes that, acknowledges that in the passage before us. 
Some parts of the body are more active, you might say. Uh, some, some parts of the body require special uh, consideration. And so we see that actually in the body of Christ, uh, that every uh, member has a particular function, and this includes even the function of being served. Look at what he says. Verse 22, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. I believe one of the images that he's using here um, is simply uh, re related to the modesty in, uh, that we use in clothing ourselves. There are certain uh, parts of our body that uh, we keep covered at all times uh, that cause great shame if they are exposed in public. Is, is that not so? And, and so we take special care, uh, it, it seems, to always be covering those. Uh, those parts of the bodies, they, re uh, they receive more ministry um, from the hands, uh, so to speak. Well, the same is true in the body of Christ, and that honors Christ and his design for his body. That there are some who may be very active in serving and there may be some that are very active in receiving. It takes a special kind of humility, though, doesn't it, to receive ministry? Um, because it is uh, true that it's more blessed to give than to receive. But apart from that, the natural human inclination is, I would rather give than receive. And that's wrong. So it's pride. It's our pride that keeps us from acknowledging our need for help, acknowledging our need for one another ministry, acknowledging our weakness. Paul says, oh, brothers and sisters, the way in which Christ puts together his body means that not every, uh, not every part has the same function, but we work together together we commune with one another. We sh communing literally being sharing. That, that word koinonia, I'm sure that you're familiar with that word. That's the idea here. Sharing with one another. A and all to this end, verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I cannot say that I'm particularly conscious of my ears on any given day. Uh, but if my ears are not uh, operating in the way that they ought to be, guess what? The rest of my body feels the effects of that. That's true of Jesus' body, too. When something is not right with any particular member of the body, there is a corresponding impact, a, a corresponding uh, suffering in the body. If any part rejoices, there is a corresponding uh, rejoicing. Uh, that's just a natural truth of the human body, and that is true also of Christ's body. So every member of Christ's body has a particular function. Um, the welfare of the body is affected by the welfare of every member of the body, as we've just said. Now, I think also, interestingly, 1 Corinthians 12 is the most extensive treatment of spiritual gifts uh, of any per, uh, other passage in Scripture. The fascinating thing is that Paul's focus is not on spiritual gifts in verses 14 through 26, not as far as I can tell. It's true in verses 1 through 11, he's focused on spiritual gifts. It's true that he focuses in verses uh, 28 and following. He returns to that subject. 
And yet he's simply talking about function and he's talking about serving um, uh, the mutual service and, and uh, 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 receiving in the body in verses 14 through 26. And, and it's led me to reflect on what may be the danger of overemphasizing spiritual gifts. Um, one of the dangers is that we focus on the more obvious spiritual gifts, right? Uh, that's actually the problem that Paul's addressing in Corinth is that there's, a, uh, there, there's an elevation of particular gifts and, and a coveting, an unholy coveting of, of those gifts uh, going on in Corinth. And he's saying this isn't good. Uh, he's actually preparing us, right, for chapter 13, which is what chapter? What do we call that chapter? The love chapter, right? He's going to show us a more excellent way. And, and the love is focused entirely on what? Service, right? It, it, it's, on, it's on acting. It's on doing. And, and so um, if I stand by and I say, you know, the spiritual gift that I have, oh, well, I don't know what my spiritual gift is, but I know that so-and-so, um, you know, uh, they have the gift of encouragement. And, and that person has a, a, a particular gift, it seems, for prayer. And, and that person is a, a, an excellent teacher. And so on and so forth down the line. We get focused on that and we get distracted from the basic principle that apart from the consideration of spiritual gifts as such, as those who commune with Christ by His Spirit, we partake of all of His gifts and graces, and we have a function in the body. Is sweeping the floor a spiritual gift? I'm not sure we would classify it as such. Is it a gift of Christ to the body? Yes, it is. It's a way of serving. And so we ought not to be focusing on, uh, on what we have or do not have in particular as spiritual gifts, um, but we ra rather ought to focus on the importance of service within the body. Uh, because as uh, we confessed, this is actually a duty, right? Um, communing as we do with Christ um, and communing as we do with each other, then we have a duty to use these gifts readily and joyfully for the service and enrichment of the other members. Now, I I, I, I hope that what I'm saying is coming across clear because when I consider this, I find this to be hugely encouraging. How many of you struggle to identify a particular spiritual gift? And in the absence of such identification, say, well, I really don't have anything to offer. Paul is refuting that notion in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And he's saying, you are integral to the body of Christ. His spirit is in you, activating you, filling you with his love, love for one another. Now go out and serve. Is bringing a meal a spiritual gift? It's a ministry, that's for sure. We'll call it that. Right? So many practical ways in which we can serve one another. And that's what the communion, uh, believers' communion with one another is all about. Now, the thing that is deadly, there are two, two, two errors that he warns against here in this passage, and this is kind of where we're going to wrap it up uh, for this evening. Uh, the one error is the error of saying, well, since I don't have blank, I don't have a purpose in the body. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a, a part of the body. You see what the point he's saying? He's talking about the mutiny of members. And it's a mutiny of false humility. It's a mutiny of saying, because I don't have that, then I don't 
I'm not going to serve. Because I don't have that, I don't have anything to offer. One error. The second error um, is uh, exactly the opposite. Uh, the eye, uh, verse 21, cannot say to the hand, I don't need you because I'm so great. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you because I'm complete. Uh, you see, uh, th there's a warning against the pride uh, that would elevate uh, whatever gift I perceive myself to have uh, and, and say, now your gifts are devalued on that basis, and you know what? I can go it alone. A different kind of mutiny from the body. And Paul says, essentially, be gone with all of that. As the body of Christ, you have the communion with Christ, and all of his riches are yours. And you have an integral place in his body. You have a function to perform. And he wants you to serve. This ought to free us. It ought to fill us with joy. And it ought to get us to thinking. What can I do? I'll give you one hint. For, uh, as you ask that question, what I, what I want to encourage you to do is I want you to to make that a matter of prayer, what can I do? And then I want you to use these and these and simply observe what's not being done and go and do it. If you are inadequate to do it by yourself, come to your pastor, come to your elders, come to your deacons and say, hey, I've noticed this. What can we do about this? And you go and you serve. That's what Christ intends for his body. And in this way, the whole body is blessed. The whole body is knit together. It is strengthened. And the remarkable thing is this. The world sees. And what the world sees is a group of people that against all odds are unified. Tell, tell me how strange a witness that would be in America in 2023. A group of people that are disparate, they're different, they're, they're all broken people that are all working together for one common goal, all serving together in humility, one common Lord. What a witness of the power, the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what he has willed for us as his body. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the grace that is ours in Christ Jesus, the communion that we enjoy with Christ, that we are co-heirs with him, and that your riches have become ours. We thank you also for the fellowship, the communion that we enjoy as a body, uh, for the fact that you have uh, brought us forth into your family that you have united us in faith as brothers and sisters in Christ and brothers and sisters even of Christ. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would give us a sense of your calling on our lives as members and that you would open our eyes, uh, that you would give us hearing ears, that we would be able to observe uh, areas of unmet need, uh, areas of needed ministry, and uh, to go in the strength of your spirit um, seeking to minister to your body for the glory of your name. For we ask it all in the name of Christ. Amen.